All right. Welcome to Stock Group. Today is Saturday, February 5th. Um, many people must be busy today. So it's just Milton and I. So I'll just go over the um, just go over the indices real quick. And then we'll just kind of free form for there from that point. So the Dow had an interesting week. Started out up three days, then down the last two. Uh, NASDAQ uh, had a, a was up good on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, but then there was a reversal on Wednesday and it just kind of crashed down Wednesday and Thursday, but tried to rebound yesterday. The Russell, pretty similar there. And then overall the S&P. I thought it was interesting yesterday uh, in S&P, how we hailed around this uh, 45 area. Um, Cause I was actually watching on, uh, on level two on my, uh, what's up Barry? Watching on level two on my um, charts and it was crazy. Cause like, if you look at, uh, let's go to the 15 minute on yesterday. Yeah, so you had a good run from like uh, 11 to about you know, 3 o'clock, 3.15. And then they just sold it off hard at the close. Uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. But even in the, in the beginning of the morning, it was kind of sideways to down from 11.15 to... Oh, no, that was the previous day. Hold on. Let me go back. Oh no, yeah, this is this is day marker here. So it's just kind of sideways it down. And then from kind of eleven fifteen to ten fifteen to eleven Eastern time. And then it just uh it went up until ten fifteen Eastern. I'm sorry, uh, three o'clock Eastern. And then it kind of gave back uh a good bit of the gains uh on the end. Uh earnings wise, pretty interesting earnings week. Uh, you look at Amazon. Again, this is a 15-minute chart. So Amazon had earnings on, uh, I guess that was Thursday. And they had phenomenal earnings came out. Uh, stock kind of gave back a little bit in after hours. And then, um, so this is after hours, the blue, the kind of the orange shading here is, is pre-market the next morning. And then this this uh, white in this area is actually the uh, regular market hours. So after hours, it went up big to 3,300, kind of closed at eight o'clock that evening at 3,195, opened the next morning and pre-market trading at uh, down to 3,076. And then when it finally opened for market hours, that yeah, first, yeah, that first bar kind of went down a lot in that first 15 minutes, but then recovered and kind of went sideways. And then again, um, from that 11.15 till about 1.45 Eastern, it was in an uptrend that kind of went sideways. And then at started this downtrend uh, at this 3.30, 3.30 mark and really closed them closed down so when you look at just from a percentage perspective gave back just in those last three bars last three minutes gave back two percent of, of the game for the day so but overall still pretty good from this um from this low at the close that uh that thursday at 27 um 2779 so Amazon had strong earnings, strong earnings. Let's look at another earnings play. Uh, Google. So Google came out with earnings as well. Uh, I think that was, was that Thursday, whatever the first was. Maybe that was Wednesday. Let's see. Yeah, I guess it was Thursday. Yep. So Google came out with uh, earnings and they, they did well. Uh, you can see after hours, it went up like 30 3053 then kind of came down um pre-market and then actually uh regular trading hours on uh so it was wednesday regular trading hours on 
on Thursday or whatever day that was, um, it just kind of started going down. And then again, and then again on Friday. So it just kind of stabilized. So it ended up closing at 28.65, where again, it hit a high of this. Yes, let's see from there, from high to low. This was down about 6% uh from high to low but still up from the earnings uh announcement still up about four percent so and for those that don't know google announced a 20 20 to one split so for every one share that you own uh if anybody owns it uh, i think they supposed to split sometime in june i believe they said and so uh you'll get 20 shares for every one that you own. So that's Google. Let's look at uh, any any comments before I go on. Anybody, anybody? Bueller? All right. I take that as a no. All right, gonna go to um, another earnings this week was uh, Facebook. Toy Toy, is that um, is that Shelly? Oh, where you where you where you? Where you? Yes, it is. How you doing? Hey, how you doing, Shelly? Hey, uh, thanks for joining. Let me just change the name here. So, it's Latoya. I'm Shelly's sister. Oh, Latoya. Okay. All right. Thanks, Latoya. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Um, I know it's your first time. I'll uh, I'll go through some some other stuff here for you in a minute. So just bear with me. OK. All right. Thank you. All right. So. Um, so we have so Facebook had earnings as well. Um, and so you can see here, Facebook got crushed in earnings. Uh, I'll just look at the daily. So you can see this huge drop in Facebook from in the earnings here. So Facebook got was down 21 percent. I'm sorry. It's down 25 percent and then even closed. Yeah. So closed at 25 percent down. So Facebook got killed. I think they said that had a huge loss. Um, and I think I want to say that there was news that the subscriber growth had had gone down for Facebook. And uh, let's see. So I think they lost subscribers for the first time, as well as I think they had a huge chargeback for their metaverse business, uh, a bunch of investments that they put in there. So let's see. trying to just get to the article talk about Facebook's earnings so, okay here we go hey wall just want to find a regular earnings report okay here we go so said, this is just Facebook themselves saying it, but the market didn't receive it well. They said that they had a good quarter, blah, blah, blah. But uh, but the market wasn't wasn't that favorable on it. Let me see. I'm trying to find a, some commentary on it. You should be able to find this pretty easily. Oh, well, won't worry about it. But anyway, from just a chart perspective, you can see that they got they're down 25 percent on that Facebook. Uh, let's see who else announced anybody stocks uh, had earnings 
this week that they know of? Yeah, All right. So I can give you one here. Uh, they didn't come out with earnings, but they have been definitely in a downturn since November here is Shopify. So Shopify is an e-commerce site. Uh, well, they sell a lot of uh, tools for people to be able to open their own online shops and sell products and services. And, and they've just been decimated since uh, since November valuation stock has been cut in half uh, down 50%. Um, so they've been getting killed. Let's look at Tesla. Tesla as well has been down. Uh, but one thing you can look at Tesla here is though at this um, 880 level, it's definitely um, this 880 level is definitely uh, uh, support. You can see even broke below that probably, I guess that was Thursday last week. Um, got down to 792, but stabilizing here on this Tesla. So let's see. Oh, UPS came out with earnings as well. So UPS had strong earnings. Uh, let's see how much up oh, they were. They got a nice pop. You can see this gap here between this candle and this candle. So earnings came out and they were up. 11% and then only gave uh, a few percentage points back on Thursday and Friday. So UPS is doing good. Uh, so now let's talk about some stocks that got a little bit of a rebound <clears throat> after they've been in a long-term downtrend. Square is one. Uh, I think they're killing Square because of the valuation. Let me see what the PE on Square is. Oh. Hey Mike, when you look at that PE, what you what you looking for? Uh, so P PE is a is a um, a ratio that basically tells you how expensive a company is relative to its earnings. So it's so it's price to earnings ratio. So typically, if you see something, the lower the number is typically the better. So yeah, it, it right. it's really a. Um, uh, a gauge or, or a ratio used to compare different companies to see which one is, is much more expensive than another. So I'll, I'll give you an example here. So you see that this uh, PE ratio on square is 93. Whereas if I go to, let's look at Apple to compare it with, right? So if you go to Apple, so Apple's PE is 28, right? So square yeah. is almost is a little two two point something times much you know more expensive than apple uh, uh hey toy can you go on mute for me please oh i'm sorry oh no you good you good uh -huh. so um so yeah so squares is two times more expensive than what apple is and so from that perspective you can just say that hey square is more expensive now if you look at this Apple stock, the actual price of the stock is 72, 172, where Square, I think it was 107 or something of that nature. Let me see. Let me get back to it. Yeah, Square is 108. So even if it's $108, it's still two times more expensive than, than what Apple is. So if you took Apple at one, 175, in comparison, Square is probably um 375 so if you double apple that'll put you at 350 and then you know whatever that percentage is so you're talking to say say two, if you just said two and a half you know square is probably uh in terms of its price relative to apple is probably a 400 dollars price target even though it's trading at 108 so it's it's a it's a means of valuing companies uh, of different sizes but what the ratio itself means is Technically, it says, how much are you willing to pay for one share of stock relative to one dollar of earnings? So it means for every dollar of earnings, you're paying ninety six dollars, whereas for Apple, for every dollar of earnings, you're paying twenty eight dollars. So 
So it's a way to value in 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 those um, Square can be categorized as a uh, a growth stock or or a higher risk stock than Apple because Apple can be looked at as a value just because the P.E. ratios are are much different. Hope mm. that answers the question. Mm. All right. And so and you got to follow up with that, Barry. No, I like Tesla. OK, that's that's good. Two hundred eight. Yeah, so you can, so even in relative to that, right? So Tesla That's not really good. Right. So from a value perspective. Now, again, there's always this this um what's the right word? There's always this this um philosophy in between growth and value. So on growth, a lot of times companies will forego profits just to get bigger and they just want to gain market share. Whereas value companies, they're typically they're more mature. They've been around for a longer time and they're really not in a in a huge growth phase of their company. They're just operationally they're efficient. And so they care more about earnings and expenses and stuff like that. And relative to the growth stocks where they're just trying to get bigger gain market share, you know, such that they can uh, eliminate competition. And then from there, once they they kind of mature, then they start focusing more on because it could be like, say, for instance, you know, Facebook has Facebook is probably a mature company now because, you know, most people are probably on Facebook that's going to join Facebook, whereas you take a square, you still have a large percentage of people that may not send money electronically. And uh, but you got other uh, competitors in that same space with uh, with Square. And even though you have competitors in, in, in the social media spaces, Facebook. But when you think about Facebook and Instagram and I think Facebook might even own WhatsApp, they, uh, yeah. you know, it's just that most people are probably on one of those three platform if they're um, if they're into the social social media thing. So they don't have that much more room to grow. Whereas Tesla, in, in comparison, you know, most people are probably still driving, you know, uh, gas powered cars versus electric cars and trucks. So it's just a difference between the growth and, uh, and, and a more stable company. So, but even, even in that, you can still have growth take place in a mature company. Uh, but they're but but they are just much more mature and they handle their their expenses better than uh than some of these you know high flyer growth companies so uh and and there so was a that, that price ahead. that price earnings does that determine and to in buying a company or not or no yeah i it, mean buying a stock i mean would you consider that a a, a stock you will hold for long term due to the price earnings yes um, you can i think that's it's a factor um and again it goes to so you have like schools of thought right meaning that some people are are less risk averse and they always want to buy something on sale so they may lean more toward value stocks which probably have lower pe uh growth those people you know like a bit more of the speculation some of the newer companies and they are willing to take on more risk, but with the risk of making more, you risk more. And so um, those companies have a higher PE. And so when you look at kind of what has happened, so if I go back here to the Russell, right, I'm just use it as a uh, indicator. So if you go back here to, this is November, right? So you can see pretty much since November, the Russell has been in a downtrend, got a little break here in December, but resume the downtrend down, right? Russell are more growth related stocks. These are small capitalization stocks. So they, they're in a more growth mode versus if you look at the Dow Jones, these are more seasoned companies and they, they're probably more on the value range, right? Now you have some companies in the Dow that, uh, that, that have some growth prospects to it, but these are more seasoned uh, companies than the Russell. And so, but as a result of that, 
what happened here is a rotation out of the growth stocks. And when you compare that same time frame going back to November, so let's just measure this. So small, if you own small capitalization stock, meaning a stock any, anywhere from 300 million to 2 billion, uh, so it's down 19% versus if you look at the Dow from where it was, you know, we're only down, what, 4%. So there was a huge rotation out of growth stocks into value stocks. And so to the question, should you use that as a factor? It really depends on your your investing style and nature. You know what? And, and I tell people to um, try to determine what your sentiment is in, in investing. So think about your personality. So, Barry, I, I've, I've talked to you enough to know that, you know, you speak in terms of, of percentages. It's like, man, it's some down three, four percent. I'm trying to take my 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 gains and move on. So just to hearing that that sentiment i know that you're much more cautious so you probably would do better to uh take more of a long-term approach and mm. and buy more value related stocks so value. Stock, yeah mm -hmm. so stocks with lower pe's yes sir mm -hmm. whereas but yes. i know you but 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 contrary to that i know you like tesla right <laughs> so yeah i like see. tesla you know because it moves you know? Well, but but that's but that's what you get with with higher PE stocks. They move, but but the move can be both ways, right? So if you look here, you know you got three moves in Tesla from these big circles off of this two eighty five. So you don't you have moved thirty six percent three different times, right? Mm -hmm. So whereas if you compare that say to a, a AT and T, which is really a so if you look at the PE here on AT and T talking about uh eight right you're not gonna get that kind of movement so even though on the chart this looks like a big move but when you measure it out you know well I said it. yeah well, it's, it's it's relatively big but you know 27 percent move you know from december to um to what is that to january but that's that typically is not that they, that big let me go out to a weekly uh, Mike, yes, sir. That's a bad example because a lot of things are going on with AT and T right now. So that's yes. what's making this chart look like that. Uh, right. Maybe one of the banks because they have a very low PE and they don't tend to be. That yeah, which one would you say one of the better banks would be? Like, let's try Chase. Let's see if they look like. Yeah. Well, and 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 here's so. If you go back to November, kind of in, you know, to Milt's point in a normal situation, let's, cause really from, from this area over. So it's kind of, eh, that's, that's my fault, Mike. I forgot. This is a special situation too. Right. <laughs> it is. That's rate. what I'm trying to explain <laughs> out. Right. Procter and Gamble. How about that one? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What, what, I, go ahead. I was like, what you what you saying? I, what, what your concept? I would say Apple, right? Yeah, Apple. I, Apple, Apple could be looked as well, but but Apple is a little bit of a hybrid. Apple is now from a from a value perspective, absolutely. But Apple still has a decent level of growth built into it as well. But just from a pure PE and value, absolutely. Apple Apple is a value based company that has growth in it and typically apple is a uh, an anomaly in this respect because most companies can't be as low of pe but still have the level of growth that it maintains at the same time so apple but yes but but just in the in the, in the traditional definition apple is a low pe stock of a 28 right so um so yeah i would go ahead Oh, he pee. Them is from them is from from where I'm talking about in the UK. He got them. I'm, I'm, Say it I'm again. Saying, one of them. Yeah. He got one hey, of them. Toy. Toy, can you go? Can you go on mute? Sorry. I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I keep going on, on mute. Oh, no worries. No worries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but yeah. So even with the even with the Apple, it's a uh, it's definitely a a growth. I mean, I'm sorry, a value based stock. And again, you can just look at these PEs. And so anytime you get a PE probably above 
40 to 50, you starting to get, you know, to the medium to high range. And then, like you say, you look back at a Tesla, you know, it's, it's just a rocket ship in terms of what their PE is. And then you have some stocks that don't even have a PE, meaning that they don't have earnings. So the PE is just, it'll just show a dash. Uh, like for instance, uh, trying to think something that, let me see if APPS has earnings. Uh, yeah, they got earnings. Trying to think of a stock that's, oh, let's see. I don't know if Robinhood making any money or not. Let's see if they got earnings. So right here, so Robinhood, you can see Robinhood doesn't have a PE ratio because they haven't had positive earnings yet. All right, so this is, this is a, you know, extremely uh, growth related stock with no oh. earnings yet. So all right. Robinhood is just trying to do is just grow, grow, grow. And at some point they're going to try to start to get to profitability. So you might want to blow up that chart a little. So Robinhood. Yeah. Yeah. You see that? Toward the end there. Yeah. Let me, uh, I don't change my drawing indicator. There you go. Yes, sir. If we were not in a bear market and I saw that, I would be all over this. Mm -hmm. You see how it's breaking that trend there? And then this formation, those last three candlesticks, that's one of my favorite formations. But uh, how many down then a reversal? So are you looking at primarily at this, uh, this long tail on this candle here? Uh, those three together these three together okay down day and sort of like that little bottom one there and then boom up day okay i love that formation now it doesn't always work but usually the next day that's the sign of a reversal too plus it broke that red line that you got down there mm -hmm. but we that's are right. it, yes mm -hmm. but but say it all that we're in a downtrend i'm not trusting that <laughs> right. Yeah, so that uh, Friday with Amazon, right? And yeah. I did a trend line, and it broke it. <laughs> it did went. It went where I needed to go. I saw that with Amazon the whole day. It yeah. broke it and went back down. And, but it was going up in the upward trend. Yeah. So if you look at this, yeah. So if you go to this Amazon, you see that Amazon broke out. <laughs> But they had this, so Amazon is was kind of funny because going into earnings, you can see leading up to earnings these three days, Amazon was on an uptrend, right? The earnings came out the day before earnings came out. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the day of earnings, Amazon dropped, but then after hours, it went back up. And so really, if you kind of disregard uh, this, this, uh, this piece right here, it was just an anomaly because and it was really, you know, nobody knew where earnings were going to be. And the earnings were was so much more powerful than what people um, had anticipated that you can almost disregard this because that trend is still intact uh, going up and to the right. So Amazon had, had definitely had strong earnings. Um, so let's let's see. Oh, I was on square. So a lot of these a lot of these stocks have gotten hit tremendously so if you see square here right square has been in free fall since october right look at this chart this is brutal when you measure this down square is down 60 percent, right so but you can see that square is putting in um starting to put in you know getting close here now part of this downtrend is time it's just running sideways. And so once you get a, a close above here, I'm probably gonna say, let me draw this line here. I probably will look right here, probably for the confirmation to the upside, this 120 area, but you might start getting people to come in because you can also say that it's starting to build a base sideways because look at here. So you had, uh, let me just note them with a circle. So you had one, two, three, and four areas that square has touched this this area. And so if they if you look at this one hundred area ninety nine, 
if it can maintain that and just go sideways, then Square might be able to build a base. And another thing that you want to look at as well is look at the volume on those on those same areas. So if you say collectively, so you look from here and you just imagine, and I'm gonna just draw it down from here just to show you. So you see the, the green box at the top corresponds with the, the lows of that uh, 102 area. But look at this volume here. You got volume higher in this in the green box down here. So I probably could have drawn that better. Hold on one second. Do this. Actually, take and get that away. So if I just draw this uh, this general area down here, so you can see you can see this volume is starting to increase relative to the volume to the left of it. So you don't get volume particularly here on the 24th the 2nd of February and the 4th of February, you don't get volume that high until you go back to August, right? And you don't even get another volume spike that high until you go back here to August of 2020, right? And June of 2020. So, and then now let's do this as well. So this is a good thing to look at when you're doing your, your support and resistance, sometimes you want to take a longer term view. So we were looking at a daily chart, right? And so as I zoomed back and I was talking about the volume, what struck me here was I was like, okay, let me chart up going back. And what you can do here is, so this is a trading view. So you got different time frames. So Toya, this will help you. Um, so these are, are like the, the minutes that you look at. So 15 minutes, hour, four hour, daily, monthly. So I was looking at a daily chart and then I switched to a monthly chart. And so if I go back to this monthly chart, these blue lines represent support areas and, and support areas. I'm looking for peaks and I'm looking for valleys. So if you see here, um, uh, kind of looking for peaks and valleys. So you can say, this is a, a, a kind of a little valley right here. And that's a little peak that's close enough. I'll just draw one there. When I go back here, I got a peak here. So I'll draw that one. I got a peak here, got a peak here. Draw that one. Then now I'm looking for my valleys. Valley here, valley here, valley here, valley here. So I can draw, I can draw this one. And then I'll take the this one to kind of account for this point. It's not quite close enough to this one, but that's fine. And I'll draw this one, right? So if you take these four, right? So now what I'm showing is look at where we're stabilizing at. We're stabilizing around in this area of the 101 area. And so sometimes it may not come exact. So if you have like, say a, a bit of a range, you can say anywhere between that 101 and, and maybe even down to the 83, you know, that this support level or this support level is getting close to to some areas for some long term support here. So and when I say that. That was a, a resistance point at some point, that was just a little bit of resistance there. And then you can see how that corresponds all the way over to where we are now. Right. And so if if square can continue to hold in this area, again, coupled with this larger volume, then you may have a reversal in play and look at this and uh, let me let me erase all this because i want to show you some one one bar kind of what milk was talking about earlier was that when you see a candle with a long stem to the bottom but a a, a small body uh this is where a reversal was trying to set in so let me see if i can find another one so here this this red candle right here it has a pretty decent stem and the body comes up there. Sometimes you can have a little reversal here, have a little reversal there. Here's a bigger one right here, a longer stem there. And you can see that that stem here and these long stems, they kind of uh, served as a basis. And those were, you know, reverse points. So it came down here, reversed and went up, came down here, reversed and went up. So here, this is like uh, what they call a doji. So a doji is that. So in reading a candlestick, 
the body is is the time frame. So whatever time frame here you have selected is the week. So the 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 colored body represent that time frame. So this is a week. Whereas the stems that go from top to bottom, the top is always going to be the high, the bottom is going to be the low. Again, when you're looking at you're on a weekly chart, then this is just going to show you that this represents the high of the week and the low of the week. But you can see this body is right here in the middle. So when you when you think about that, what this is really uh, telling you is that you had many buyers that thought this thing was going to go up, but then it reversed and came down. And then you had many sellers thought it was going to go lower, but buyers came back in and brought it up. So you kind of almost like in the middle. So if you look at these last two bars, they're really like saying buyers and sellers are pretty equal in terms of you can say nobody really won in these two bars. Right. So these last two weeks, the stock is just kind of going sideways. You probably got equal number of buyers than you do sellers. Does that make sense? Does everybody see that? Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay. All right. And it's also confirmed on higher volume, right? So these two pieces together, you just want to want to go ahead and put your your horizontal line here. So you're talking 108. Now that's on the weekly. So now if I go back to the daily chart, you can see how that box is playing out. So they've just been in a range here from 128 down to 99. So if I tighten the box up a bit, you can see this is the range that we're in. But that bar right here from this 108 to this 99, so you got about a $10 range that this thing is. And this is where you, and so even if I pull this down just for that range, you just wanna see if Square can be able to maintain this range and if it does, you may start to see a base build. Now, when we throw that on and we couple it with this downtrend. So on a downtrend, all I need is two points on the chart to make a line. So I'm going to use the I'm going to show you the two points that I use to to get the slope. So the first point I'm using is here at the top of this this bar. And then I'm going to use this one right here as the second point top of that one. And if I just get those two touching or close to touching, uh, that's going to give me the slope and I'm just going to extend the slope down. So what you, you're looking for here is that you're waiting for a reversal. And you can see here, we had a couple of times where this thing stopped, looked like it was going to come back, but then only continued lower. Stop went sideways, thought it was going to break to the upside. It didn't continue lower. Again, going sideways, thought it was going to break above right in this area. It didn't continue lower. And so until you get a confirmation to the right side of here, that you're still in a downtrend. So I'm looking probably at this 120 mark as the confirmation to say, hey, this thing is truly bottomed out. Now it's going to go back up. So now and one and so i'm, I'm, I'm like we're gonna do a little segment today called uh what do you know right um because sometimes in and, and, and i'll just talk about it here just looking at this if if anybody has saw this chart draw this trend line and if they say hey if if i'm gonna just be patient and wait till i get confirmation you got a little bit of a fake out right here got a little bit of a fake out and it resumed lower but after November, you didn't have another another breach of that until you got right here at February 1st. But then it was a fake out too, and it went lower. So until you get a confirmed confirmation, maybe two or three bars close to the upper right, you should just wait. Now, that's what I know. That's not what I did because I'm a square holder and I've been buying square on the way down now, but I didn't follow kind of what I knew and what the chart was showing me. So sometimes this is kind of where your patience and, mm -hmm. and, and really stopping and thinking about what it is that, you know, and yeah. are you taking that data into consideration and are you acting accordingly? So right. in this case, in this case, I didn't. 
you know, so and and, and you know, one thing about trading is you're going to be wrong at some point, right? Trading and investment, you're going to be wrong. And it's just that how wrong you be, how long you want to hold, you know, because sometimes you, you want to be right for the sake of being right, where it's costing you money. Um, so just getting your mental game together is is a whole nother you know ball game yeah absolutely <laughs> it is Abs- man absolutely and that that mental game is is is, is tough because I, I read a book a long time ago talking about trading and it was written by the psychologist and he said the market is really nothing but a mirror to show you who yeah, you are in terms of your yeah. greed your greed <laughs> and your and your uh um and your fear and so mm-hmm. if you're greedy and you're fearful the market will create conditions where that greed and fear will come out and you got to try to put things in place to manage it. And, and when you're new, you know, you, you kind of learn some things, but the, the, the main thing to this and, and milk can definitely speak to this is that you just want to be in this game long-term the way that you be in the game long-term is you have to manage your capital because right here. So say for instance, Let's just take some some arbitrary numbers, right? So we're talking down 59%. So let's just say you had a thousand dollar portfolio, right? Down 59%, you're down five hundred and ninety dollars. So that means this portfolio was from a thousand at its peak. Now it's worth four hundred and ten dollars. That's what that's that's and and if you and let's say you got scared down here at the bottom and you couldn't stand to lose anymore and you sold it right and for some people that has happened in this downturn some people have given up the ghost and and, and sold a lot of things where they if they take the long-term view and say that i believe that this this stock is going to come back and i have some conviction on it then they can sell now by the same token, you can have others that are in this stock and say, hey, I'm trading this thing. I see it's in a downturn, so I'm going to set some areas. So like here, they can say, hey, if it breaks support here at the 227, I'm out. If it breaks support at 194, I'm out. If it breaks support here at 158, I'm out. So this is giving you multiple opportunities as it's broken down through support levels to get out. And so if you if you obey this and got out and just waited till all this carnage got through, you saved yourself a lot of money that way as well. So there are just things when this market changes direction. And and so what they said with it was sometimes you if you listen to CNBC, they'll talk about risk on risk off risk on means that, you know, buy growth stock. Risk off is sell growth stock, buy value stocks, or get out of the market completely. You know, now, and again, even within that, if if you're trading, then you you have to be quick on the trigger. If you're a long-term investor, you have to have some conviction. And but sometimes these pullbacks, like this is a 50% pullback, this will test your conviction about how, how long of a trader you are. Um, you know, I'm sorry, long of a investor or long term perspective that you have. So, um, I, I'll I'll pause there. Any questions or feedback? Yeah, I did have something else totally different, but um, like think and swim, right? So I had like 20 stocks this week, okay, mm-hmm. and so it was going up two percent. So I was like, I need to sell it, but I had my trailing stocks. Mm-hmm. on every stock on mm-hmm. those 20 stocks do you know how to sell all those 20 stocks at the same time there's no way to sell them uh all at the same, same time no you have to yeah okay the, the best you know, way sir, you know, okay no go ahead go ahead no i was just saying because you know certain stocks was going down i and, and you what you said was like in theory so there's the 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 the, the, the application process of like um, selling at that moment of time, if if it's if it's going up, coming down fast, and then being able to sell it, you know, as soon as soon as it hit that point, and that's a that's something I'm working on. 
Yeah. Now, and yeah, and that's something we can we can definitely get into in terms of the te- the technical part of the computer part. That's what yes. I'm trying to say. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we'll talk about order orders and 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 like that. So let's uh let's finish the the stock part and then we'll we'll go into that. Barry, any other any other feedback on uh on this trend? Uh, the support point uh, candlesticks uh, floors open. Um, confirmation. You, you so how long you say you uh, wait for confirmation? It just depends. It could be two days, three days, four days. Is correct? Well, in this case, this is going back to October. Yeah. So right. It could be a- so right. So you just so it is is no amount of time per se. You just got to look at your charts and draw your trend lines. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Question? Comment? One thing I want to look at. This goes all into what you're saying, and uh, maybe help explain uh, a little bit more about PEs and things like that. Could you look at Snap? Yeah. And L- Latoya, um, one of the things is so just i know it's your first day so what we're these are just charts right so charts is from a school of what they call technical analysis right so you're just looking at price points for a particular instrument based upon you know some time frame and then to be able to chart it whereas the question that milk just asked when i was talking about pe pe is a different type of analysis that talks about what is called fundamental analysis so fundamental analysis is is really just talking about the the sales of a company the expenses uh the taxes uh the earnings and 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 the like so um that's more on the fundamental analysis side and that's that has nothing to do with charts particularly but um and we can go into more of the fundamental analysis at some point, but I just want to let you know that those are kind of two different types of things. But what we're doing in this case is that we're using a bit of the fundamental analysis coupled with the technical analysis of the charting to, to come up with uh, um, like a, a strategy or using both pieces of that information in order to make a decision. Okay. All right. So I'm sorry. Here we go. Milk on a uh, snap. Okay, what makes this chart different and everything and what ties it into PE, if you see the last uh, candlestick there, you go, what happened? Look at the volume. Look how much it jumped up. And what happened was it earned money. All this time, this stock has lost money. And this is the first time it has ever earned money. Would I buy this now? Uh, no. <laughs> but I would. This is where you have to look at two different things: analysis. When this thing jumped up this high with that type of volume, that is a clear signal that something has fundamentally changed to the, with this stock. And the, what changed is. It will finally get a PE. It will probably be a ridiculously high PE, but what Wall Street looked for is money. And this stock is going to start earning money. You can clearly see that it's probably going to definitely go back up to its highs. So what Mike was saying, if you were a snap owner and you just, you know, I'm this is a long-term stock for me. I believe it has a future. So you dollar cost average all the way down here and boom you haven't got all your money back yet but one your cost average is a lot lower and two you see a future where you are probably going to make a lot of money in this stock so a PE it is not something that you can just take by itself like I said this has been negative all this time and this stock has really been going up it's getting killed now because remember when the Fed started uh, taking away money at the market, removing quantitative easing, and start raising interest rate. If you're losing money, you're gonna get slaughtered. And we have seen that time and time again. Square is another example of that. But all of a sudden, this stock 
has started making money. So now the story has changed on it. And it it will probably go back down because this is a really big jump in one day. But in the future, more than likely, this stock is going to start going up. So a PE is not a bad thing or a good thing. It just shows you a, a snapshot of what a company is doing right now. It's losing a lot of money. It's gaining a lot of money. You got to couple that with a story of what's going on with a stock. To buy this <clears throat> a stock like this down here, you got to have some high conviction and you got to have a long time frame that you're going to make all your money back plus. Or why else would you buy it? Let me ask you this. If it's going in an upward trend, would you buy it? If you see it start forming in an upward trend, would you buy it? Uh, believe it or not, it is going to be an upward trend. It's just all compacted to one day. Yeah, I'm saying if you saw more green candle like candles going upward, would you buy it? Okay, here's the deal with this one, and that for that question, I'm giving you a bad example for that question, and the reason why is because it went up so high in one day. Mm -hmm. I would have to let it go down some, and just start with you know uh mike was saying a base where you see that yeah. line that he drew the last line that he drew when mm -hmm. i was expected to start bouncing around that digesting these enormous gains but i suspect especially i have to preference this to everything we're in a bear market right now a bear technical market let me just say so i can't trust stuff like i normally would all right. I would wait a day or a week or so and see how this behaves, and I would start buying in dollar cost averaging in that. But because right. of the market we're in, I have to be very cautious. I know it's a lot, and it is, but the basics are really simple. Greed, fear, and what things will look like in the future. You have to sort of, I hate to say predict, but that's what you have to do, sort of predict what the future is going to look like. If you're a snap holder, you see all these things that you've been waiting for finally coming true. Tesla is another example of that. It would it started making money and all of a sudden it just boom. I mean, uh, what was it? The last two years have just been an incredible run. And the reason for that is it started making money. His P used to be negative. Then his P was over a thousand. And now, uh, what was the last one, Mike? Uh, two eighty-eight. P's two eighty-eight. Yeah. Uh, probably this year or early next year, it's going to be double digits. Hey, double digits! Wow. <laughs> so it's triple digits now next year or even this year it just tesla is a weird bird because it's growing so fast all of a sudden you're going to have a pe you know below 99. All right. let me uh so I, I i get what you're saying on the snap what uh you, i don't even know what snap is what is that snapchat oh snapchat okay i got you I guess. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I don't know about Snapchat. And so I was listening to somebody talking about, well, I was even thinking about what you said, stuff that you own, uh, Mike, like what you use every day, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I see the kids doing Snapchat like they used to do. You yeah. know, not, you know, so I don't know. If, I mean, long term, like, I don't know if Snapchat gonna be around to be honest with you. You got TikTok taking out the game and Instagram and right. all this other stuff. I don't I don't see it for a long term for us uh a company, you know. And yeah. then uh unless Facebook maybe buy, but I just don't see that either. So um and it's kind of go back to my question with Peloton. Peloton, do you see that? Is that a COVID situation? Because it, it made all this money during COVID, 
And now the stock done dropped down, lost so much money. And now uh, it went back up probably like 20, 20 something percent the other day because Amazon talk said they might buy it, you know. But then I started thinking, I was like, anybody can make a bike. bike. I don't know, what, unless it's a experience, I don't, I don't know. Like if Amazon wanted to make a bicycle, so they can make a bicycle so. or, well, or yeah. Costco. I don't know. And so it's, it's, it, it's, it's, all, it's, it's actually when you look at, when you look at, um, so you got Tesla, you got Tesla, the stock, then you got Tesla, the fanboys, fangirls, right? Because Tesla, people have pretty high conviction for Tesla, either one way or another, either they love it or they hate it. And then you got some people in the middle, but I think you got a lot of people on the extremes. And so when you compare that kind of to, so some people was just in Tesla just for the growth of the stock. Other people right. love Tesla for the product itself. For the I product, think, right. Yeah. And I think it's similar with Peloton. I think you have a bunch of Peloton people that own the bikes and they love them. And I think there's like Peloton communities and, you know, they're, they're, mm. they're just really believers of the, of the product. The product. But mm. then you have these, these other people that is just looking at Peloton as a stock and saying that it's overvalued and it doesn't make any sense. And like you said, you know, anybody can put a bike and, you know, stick an iPad on top and, you know, you got a Peloton. It's, it's not the same, but, but, you know, and you got these memes and stuff out of there. You know, people like to make fun and jokes, but to your point, even in hearing you explaining it like that, is that you don't put a whole lot of value in a bicycle with an iPad on top of it. Right. No, just just the way you kind of said it. But uh, uh, a fitness enthusiast may look at that totally different and they may be and they may be willing to pay because they can say, hey, this Peloton is a spin cycle bike that's worthy of, you know, it's high price premium. Right. And so it just it's just really a matter of. So Peloton is in really let me, let me see what the ticker is. All right. So let's let's look at this. Because this kind of helps the example of what we were talking about before. So number one is you look here to the right, Peloton doesn't have any earnings, right? So number one, we know that it's new. So when a stock is new, what they're looking for is just growth, right? So I don't know how long Peloton has been around as a company, but in terms of trading on the market, they only came to the market in 2019, right? And they came to market at 20 26 27 dollars 24 dollars somewhere around in there and, and then, then the you pandemic. had this then you had this this crazy run you know up to you know this this 170 off of the 16 dollar low here of of uh pandemic low march 23rd 2020 right so they went up crazy now but when you look at this they didn't even have a pe so that means it's just astronomical in terms of evaluation. So this is, so this here is, you just look at all of this as growth. As just get as as much sales you can, grow the company, hire employees, you know, advertise like crazy, sell as many bikes, manufacturers as much as you can. Cause we want to try to get to a point where we can make a lot of money, expand our, our uh, well, sell a lot of bikes, not necessarily make money, expand our company, because we want to get to a point where we can get profitable. Whereas on the other side, you take, uh, you take these guys and you say, no, this crap is over overpriced. And you know what? It's a, it's a bike with an iPad stuck on top of it. It's not worth it. So these guys come in and then they say, Hey, here's the first leg down. Here's a huge second leg down. And then this is the third leg right now you have to take this in in context so on the earlier chart what did i show you all back here in november right here so starting in november let me just kind of draw this one a little bit over this november piece here we've been in a downturn right and there was a transition from from uh um from growth stocks to value stocks so when a market rolled over, this had already started a downturn, but then you can see that it accelerated. So this last little uh, vertical bar here, see how much they lost. So they lost a gang of money on, on one. This is a daily 
uh, I guess weekly. So on one week, they were down 40 something percent. And then from there, this goes back to the week of November 8th. And again, now you in the thick of the market rolling over for selling all the growth stocks and moving to value. And they got hit an additional 58% from there where they were already down from the peak. Even to the, from here, they're down 68%. Then you add another 58% on top of that. Now you're, you're, you had a 130% down and now you're down, you know, 147%. That's huge. That's huge. I'm sorry, not 147, but 80, 86%. I'm sorry, I was looking at the wrong number. So 80%, 86% down. So this this stock, it it got it it grew really fast. The valuations got out of control. People start selling off on it, taking profit. And then the overall market shift from growth to value. And it got killed. So the growth to value shift, like right here, you're talking another. 76% down where they had already suffered uh, a 68% move to the downside. So, so, and so you got to know what it is that you're holding. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, we just look at these names and look at the tickers and we look at the, the charts, but you got to understand a bit about the business. You, you need to know where we are in the market cycle. And so let's, let's, let's go back to that. So Mil- Milton mentioned this earlier when he said, uh, he said, Hey, I'm scared. Uh, we're in a, we're in a pullback. So let me erase a bunch of this stuff. So this is S and P 500, right? Uh, move the chart down. So it's S and P 500. So t- typically we hit a top here and let me go to a daily. All right. So we hit a top here in January on the S and P, right? So we've pulled back to the lows, had a 12% correction, right? All right, so that's S and P. Look at the Russell. Again, the Russell is um, small caps, right? So you look at the Russell since November to the lows, we were down 22%. So technically. Uh, a 20% pullback is a, is a bear market. A 10% pullback is referred to as a correction in an index. That's the technical definitions, right? And then you can compare that. So when you see here, the, the S&P is down, you know, 10%. The Russell's down 22%. You look at the NASDAQ from its highs, again, back in November. So you can look at, so you can look at the Russell and NASDAQ as a a combination of small cap stocks in addition to tech stocks. And they're down 20% just from an index perspective. The individual names are for a lot of them are down much worse like we saw in Square. And so part of the story is that tech has gotten killed and a rotation out of uh, growth stocks into value stocks or a rotation out of small cap stocks into large cap stocks, right? And if you're holding stocks that fit either two of those categories, you're probably down. So that's why it's important to kind of know what it is that you're owning, where we are in the cycle, because this affects, you know, what happens to what you're holding. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. So we're in a bear market. Yep. Yep. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what. So uh, Milton has talked about this a fair bit. Uh, I have. We're really waiting to see what the Fed is going to do. Right. They're the boogeyman in the room right now. And and uh, I think it was was it last week or week before last that um, um, Jerome Powell, Fed chairman, came out and said that, hey, we're going to have more rate hikes uh, in the coming months. I think they said initially there was going to be three, but I think he put on the table possibly four or more. And so that spooked the market. One thing the market wants is they want to have some, they don't want to be surprised. They want to have some stability based upon the information. 
But since the Fed chair has not um, said specifically how many rate increases they're going to be, um, the market has some uncertainty there. And so when you have uncertainty, you're going to have volatility. So you so and you can look at volatility as being look how big these bars are, these shaded areas, you know, smaller, bigger, even bigger, you know, and bigger than that. Right. So and but you got these down moves, you got four moves down, three moves sideways, four moves up, you know, and two moves that one move down and then uh, uh, kind of a, a, a sideways day. Right. But this is volatility. And when you get that volatility, the market doesn't know, you know, overall we're in a downtrend in a Dow just a little bit. But you're right here to some support right at this 43, 44, 141 area. And that's just the Dow. So that's the um, large 30 large industrial companies. Whereas when you go to the, the NASDAQ, these are tech companies. And you see, you know, tech has been in reversal since January. You know, and I've talked about the Russell free fall since November. Right. So we got to get some stability here. Um, and until I think we get uh, a rate raise, that first rate raise out of the way, and hopefully that'll happen in March, I think the market will kind of figure out what it's going to do. But personally, I just think we may have some more choppiness. Now, here's the question. Do we think that the the um, so let's go to well, let's just go back to the S and P. Are these the lows for the S and P? Are the lows put in? I don't know. It's possible that the lows for the year have been put in on S and P. For the Russell, it's a little bit shallower. Could the lows be put in here at this nineteen hundred for the S and P? I mean, I'm sorry for the Russell, for the Nasdaq. You know, this 1300, I mean, 13,000, could that be the low area? You know, I don't know, but it's, it's, it's possible. So just want to continue to look at the overall. So that's why I spend time kind of when we start what the larger indexes are doing, because when they talk about the market, this is what they're talking about. The Dow, the NASDAQ, the Russell, and then sometimes people don't look at these three individually. They'll just look at the S&P as being a composite of all of these three combined. OK, and so just this one, you can look at the S&P just to represent the entire market. Right. And they may just use this. And, and, and furthermore, the money, money managers, pension funds and all that, they're graded against the performance of the S&P. So if you just want to look at one index, look at the S&P. And I said this back in, uh, I remember in, what was that? November? Yeah, October. We got down to this 4,300 level. And I think I remember telling you all in a few meetings, I said, watch this 4,300. If we break below this 4,300, which we did back in January 24th, we touched it 25th, 26th, close on the 27th, touched it again on the 28th of January. If I said, if we break below this and go lower and stay lower, we might be in trouble. But this has served as a, a line in the sand and served as a strong support point that we touched it, but we bounced off. So to me, this 4,300 still stands as the area. If we break below 4,300, we're in trouble where we can now start looking at going back possibly to this 4,100 and possibly again to the fifth. So, so let me let me let me just draw this. So I'm, I'm gonna speak to this a little bit. Milton made this point earlier. He said, sometimes you just gotta watch and see what the market is doing. You try to anticipate, but in certain cases, when things happen, you need to know where the support areas are below you, because just because we 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 touched this area three different times here or four different times you know and well not necessarily four but four general areas three general areas where we touched this time it doesn't necessarily mean that that can hold and we can't go lower right if we do go lower you want to see where is a possible reversal point so we got a possible reversal point here at the 4165 possible reversal point at 4064 
possible reversal point at 30, 39, 75. So you want to see where these areas are just in case if you see if we're going to get a bounce. But right now, this 4,300 is my first line in the sand. If we break below that, then, you know, we could get some choppiness up in here. You might get a little bounce right here at this 40, 4238 or could go lower to this 40, 4165. Say if we broke lower to that 4165, right? Then you might look at this 4061. So, and, 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 and again, if, if we go lower, we're looking at the S and P, you can best believe that stocks that you hold are going to be going lower as well. Because remember the S and P is nothing but a collection of the individual names, 500 stocks in the uh, S and P 500. So any of those 500 stocks, if the overall S and P 500 is down, then those 500 stocks are going to be down. If those are one of the stocks that you own, it's going to be down as well. So we take a top down approach to the market. Look at the indices, then look at the sectors, and then look at the, your individual stocks because all stocks belong to a sector and all sectors belong to an index. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, let's see. So let's. So there's a question here about. Uh, so we spent a lot of time on on the. Let's see. On. Um, let me move this over. Let me share this other screen. Bear with me. Uh, let me share this other screen out. So I can show both of these. So you should be able to, can you all see my, uh, my, uh, my phone to the right? Can you all see this? Yes. No, maybe. Yeah, I see it. Okay. So Barry, you talked a bit about like the order, uh, stuff. So let's, let's just go through this. So this is just a, a um, trading account, just a, a sample trading account. So let's say, for instance, and let's, you know, what? say we're in, so I'm, I'm going to go to your, uh, we'll go to Tesla, Barry. So we're going to talk about this. All right. So, so Tesla right now, you can see this little chart here Let me change this to a uh, one day all right so let's say let's say i have tesla at the 923 area now let's say i want to sell it right and let's just say i'm gonna say one share of tesla now here is you can put in different order types right so you can put in so these are the different order types if i can all right, so you see here, so it says limit. So a limit order says that I want to sell something, but I only want to sell it and get a price of at least 926 or higher, right? There's a stop, there's a stop price. A stop means that the stock is trading higher and you want to set a stop price lower. So say we at 923 and you want to sell the stock if it gets down to 920. So if it goes lower than 920, you want the order to trigger at 920, right? So that's what a stop does for you. What a stop limit does is it combines both the limit order and a stop order together. So the limit says, hey, I wanna trigger if the stocks get down to 922, but I only wanna sell it, I, I want, well, I said they're wrong. I want the, the stop to be at, at 922, but I want to sell it for more than $920. So I can put in the stop at 922 
and then but I want to make sure that the limit that I get at least nine hundred and twenty dollars on it, right? So you can put a combination of a stop limit order, right? So that's another order type. A trailing stop is say this. So the stock is trading at nine twenty three thirty two, but a trailing stop is what it allows you to do. Say for instance, you bought Tesla say at eight hundred and fifty dollars, right? It gets mm-hmm. up to this nine twenty three, and you say, you know what? I want to protect some of my gains. So the question becomes then is how much room do you want to give it from its current price to be able to say, when do you want to sell it? So I'll say, I'm going to set a trailing stop and I'm going to give it say $4. Okay. So what that means is that you take the current price minus $4 and that's where the the uh, um, the trailing stop will trigger. So at this current price of nine hundred and twenty three dollars, the trailing stop will be set at nine hundred and nineteen dollars and thirty two cent. So that means it's a four dollar buffer from the current price. So what that means, if if Tesla continues to go up, let's say Tesla goes straight up to nine thirty, what's going to happen is that trailing stop is going to trail by four dollars below the highest price so if it gets up to 930 then that means the trailing stop has moved up to 926 because that's a four dollar difference now if tesla starts to come back down from 930 say it goes from 930 to 928 927 when it hits 926 then that's where that stock will sell at at 926 but as long as it goes up is going to trail behind four dollars or whatever the amount that you set as the trailing stop is from the high price but once it eclipses the most high and then if it starts to come down wherever that number stopped at in terms of your trail is going to stop there and hold and then if it comes down and goes below that number that's where that order turns into a market order and at a sale so that's what a trailing stop is uh moc is market on close means that if you're in a stock and you want to close out and all all platforms doesn't have a market on close uh option but i know th- i'm on the thinkorswim uh, uh mobile app here as and so you should be able to do this as well uh so market on close say you're in a position and you only want it to be a day trade then you can say market on close so whatever the 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 price is at the close it'll go ahead and sell it for you there and then I don't know what LOC stands for. Uh, I don't know if that's last. On, oh, that must be mark on close and then last on close. But I, I have to verify that because I haven't used these two. But I think okay. that's what they mean. And then you have a market order, meaning that whatever is trading at, sell it for me as, as fast as possible. And I might get some slippage in the price, but that's what the market means. And so we went over the limit. So it just cycled through limit, stop, stop stop limit trailing stop market on uh, mark on close and then last on close so those are the 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 orders there and then on the buy same limit uh uh same uh, um um order types they just work a little bit differently so which which one you you'd like to use so um sometimes i use market orders if i want to get into something quickly um other but a lot of times i use limit orders such that if because if a stock is moving very fast you want to put in a limit order so you don't uh uh it doesn't you don't pay too much or you get too much slippage but the mm-hmm. risk of that is it can run away from you so say you're in tesla tesla's running fast it's, running. it's yeah. jumping between you know say it's like you know every time you look at the ticker change it changes five dollars so if i put it in a market order and it's trading at 923 from the time I enter the order to when it actually gets filled, it may be up at 928 and I would have bought it at $5 higher. Whereas I put in a limit order and say, Hey, I only want to pay uh 924 for it. Mm-hmm. I run the risk that it's already higher than 924 and my order doesn't get filled on a limit order. So right. one is about being patient and taking the risk of it's going to come to your price. The other is being a little less patient, but you wanted to execute immediately. So, right. Cause it's moving so fast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yep. Yep. 
So those are things that, you know, so in, in, and again, again, we spent a lot of time on the charts and the analysis, but how you manage your portfolio is important. And I will say this, you have to have some approach. And, and again, I, I would say, figure out kind of what your strategy is. Are you one person that like to take risk or are you a person that's that's more cautious and, you know, you know what your temperament is and and write those things down and i i tell people try to invest and or trade that's more um closely related to what your what your makeup is if you're a risk taker then you're probably gonna you know buy growth stocks and you know take more risk if you're less conservative you know or or more conservative should i say and, and less risky then you probably are gonna uh, uh, be more value oriented, take less risk, and and don't take big losses. You know, so you probably don't bet as much um, on your plays and and look at your position sizing uh, and, and all of that. And so, but but with both of those in mind, managing your portfolio because if you lose your money, it just if, if you lose all your money in a particular account then you're out of the market you can't participate and you wait and you have to try to figure out how to raise some more money and fund that account again to get back into the market so capital preservation is number one you have to figure out how to you know maintain your capital number two is identifying what your goal is is it is it a long-term goal or is a short-term goal are you an investor or are you a trader and then if you're an investor, then you have to think about how are you going to invest? Are you going to invest all at one time? Are you going to dollar cost average? You know, uh, and if you're a trader, what what determine your trade setups? What are your tolerance for your losses? You know, and, and, and sometimes you have to also determine, like, let's say you 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 think of yourself as a trader, but you operate more as a in as an investor in the long term and it may it may take some time to work that out because you might want to be one thing but the way that you react during times of, of of stress you may react a different way so trying to figure those things out writing them down and and we can you know go over them in a session if we need to and we don't have to use anybody's real numbers, but we can just use some fake numbers to, to, to get the concepts because I think that those are important. And I mean, and, and I'll just be transparent. I, I want it to be a trader. I can trade a little bit, but my natural tendency is buy and hold. That's kind of who I am. And I, I tried to trade for a long time. And my, when I went back and kind of did an analysis of where I was most successful, I was more successful buying holding than I was trading. And it took me a long time to figure that out. But then I just tried to start to uh, uh, pattern myself more based upon my makeup than than the ideal of what I wanted to be versus what I was. So um, so I don't know if that helps anybody, but, but think about that and, and figure out um, who you are and try to trade in line with who you are in terms of your personality and, and your, your skills and, and your decision-making uh, and, and, and your fear and your greed. Um, and I think those things will help you. Uh, that's very important. Yep. Yep. So uh, let's see who else we got on. A few of y'all been pretty quiet. Let's see. Latoya, I know it's your first time. Uh, you can come off mute. Did we completely confuse you? Um, I'm just, I'm just observing. <laughs> so, okay, but, but but we can walk you through it. It's 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 not as it's not that as bad. It, it takes some time. So if you if you're willing to put in the time, we'll we'll work with you to get you to where you need to be on it. Um, so yeah, so just. Just hang in there with us, and um, after everybody drop off, if you hold on, I'll just show you some 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 basic stuff to kind of help bring some of this stuff together. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Andre, you got anything? What's going on, man? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
What's up, bro? How hey, you doing? Oh, man. You know, I've been running back and forth with that and all them, man. So everything okay, though. Okay. Good. Um, Question. When you say long-term buy and hold, is that for, like, a specific retirement plan? Or do you have a number that you want to get to out of that stock, then jump out and jump back in? So for me, and, and this and this is, this varies, uh, you know, for each person. So, but for me, I, I usually when I say long term, I'm I'm really just looking toward like uh, probably ten year, fifteen year outlook. So you know, given my age, yeah, it'd be like retirement stuff, because right. I don't I don't take I typically don't take money out of the market. I just leave it in there, and so okay. um so yeah, so my long term is is retirement and future future funds. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's my answer. Well, let me ask you this quick question. If <laughs> I'm still running a real, real decent full 1k, should I be looking long-term for my, uh, just trying to put cash money somewhere to make like a, a small percentage back on it? Because I put a lot in my 401k and... Uh, I'm that, that's just like having two retirement plans with that being one that, that I'm managing. Well, it's, it's a great point. So what I would say is, yes, that you you have a, a another retirement plan outside of your 401k. And like, so what I do is I can trade a portion of my 401 within my brokerage account. That's just where our company has it set up. But I also trade or invest in a, uh, I have a Roth IRA. And so the idea, and this is a little bit of just some retirement talk, guys, but the idea is, so you can't touch any of your 401k before you reach 59 and a half without penalty. And, and right. there's a there's an exception to it, but I won't talk about the exceptions right now. So, but, but let's just say that. So in the 401, you, you just, you know, you're putting money in it, you allocating whatever it's doing, it's doing what it's doing, right? But right. on the, on the Roth, Roth is after tax money. So say for instance, you get, get your paycheck, you got some extra left over, you throw it over in the Roth. Any of the money earnings that you make on the Roth in, in any of those, uh, those uh, um, stocks or whatever you have in there, and if it makes money, any of the withdrawals are tax-free in the future. So think of it this way. Uh, 59 and a half, you can start taking withdrawals out on your 401 the for everybody that's still working now uh you probably have at least 65 maybe 67 for before you can retire at full retirement age so let's say you want to retire at 62 right and you say hey i want to retire at 62 but i don't want to start drawing my social security because i know every year that i delay on my social security i'm going to get an eight percent raise Right. So every year you delay on claiming your social security until you reach full retirement age as an eight percent raise. So you say, all right, now do I have money in another account that I can use where I can retire at sixty-two but not start claiming my my uh my uh, social security benefits, say until sixty-five or sixty-seven, whatever my full retirement age is based upon your age, right? Do you have any money that you can that can float you? So if you have a four, uh, a Roth IRA and you've been saving up money there and you got other savings, other investments, then you can live off of that money and not touch, you know, and not have to claim your uh, uh, your Social Security benefits and let that 8% uh, gain each year. So let's say I want to retire at 62 and a half. I do that. I need two and a half years worth of money. I figure out what my budget is. Let's just say I'm spending, you know, $2,000 a month. You know, that's $24,000 a year. Let's say I saved, uh, uh, say roughly $75,000 in a, in a, in a Roth IRA. That's two and a half years worth of $2,000 uh, a month to be able to tie me over until I hit 65. Then at 65, so I can use that money up. It's already been taxed because it's in a Roth 401k, I withdraw that to be able to live on. And then when I hit 65, now I, I, I've actually gained eight, eight and four. So 16, so I gained a 20% raise on my, uh, uh social security 
because I delayed it for two and a half years. So whereas, so if you just take, you know, let's just do some simple numbers. So if you take, if I was going to get a thousand dollars a month on my, uh, 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 401, I mean, I'm sorry, a thousand dollars a month on my social security. And if I waited for those two and a half years, where as opposed to getting a thousand dollars a month, now I'm going to draw, uh, $1,160 a month because I got that additional two and a half years at about an 8% a year. So that gives me an uh, extra $160 in my social security a month. So that's, that's one way that I think about trying to have some money outside of my 401k outside of the, uh, uh, social security piece such that if I did want to retire early, I got some money to live off of and I can allow my social security to, to grow even higher. So I hope that helps. Yep. Yep. Milt, you got any, any comment on that social security talk? You hit it right on the head. Most people don't realize wealth is generated in this com- country through land and through the stock market. If you want to retire a millionaire, most people have the opportunity. It just, do you really want to take the pain to do that? Or you can retire well. You may not have a million dollars, but you have a, more than enough money that you want to travel if you want to. You want to buy yourself a bigger house or a nicer house, things like that. What you have to do is exactly what Mike said, just dollar cost average into things like boo. You don't care what the price of boo is. You care about how many shares of you have because you got a long horizon before you retire. I mean, most people are probably going to work 30, 40 years. If you start just doing boo, as soon as you get a job, $10 a month, and then as your salary increase, you increase that. By the time you retire, you are going to retire so well with money that you never even dreamed of. So you have to always start off as an investor. And once you see your money growing to a certain level, you can start using extra money. Yeah, you broke up a little there, Milt. You said you can start using extra money, and that's the last thing we heard. Yeah, give Milt a second. I think he may just have some uh, connectivity issues. Milt, can you hear us? Yeah. So uh, I think the point is, is that start. So the thing about investing that he hit on is really about time and what time equals in an investing situation is time is, is, is synonymous with compound growth. So if you're, so when he was talking about VU, VU is V O O is the Vanguard S and P 500 ETF. And if you dollar cost average into this, so if we go back and this just chart just goes back to 2011. So that's all the history we have here on this, but we'll just use it nonetheless. So since 2011, this is up 467%, right? And so over time, this account would have grown four and a half times, a little bit more than four and a half. So if you say it started with, so what, what does that look like? So let me show you. Uh, let, me, let me find this real quick. Uh, so this is a, um, this is a, um, kind of a, a, a chart to, to show like the growth of, of money. So let's say you got 500 bucks, right? All right. And let's say that you grew that account, uh, say 15% a year, right? So you start with a thousand dollars and that account grew. Are you back milk? 
Uh, no, he's not back yet. Okay, so you got a thousand. You got a thousand bucks, and every year that account grows by fifteen percent, right? So that's what it, it means. So each year in this first column, one, two, three, four. This represents years, and then this here represents the value of that compounded amount. So you just put it in one time, and it just compounds. So again, take the prospect of a 30 year career, right? So if you invested a thousand dollars one time, and if you could average 15% a year, now that's aggressive, I know, but it's for this illustration, that thousand dollars will be $66,000 in 30 years. That's the power of time and compound growth. So a thousand to 66,000, right? So now let's just say you add a zero to that. You start with 10K, right? Just add it, just, just add a zero to that and fucking type here. So now you say that that thousand, that 10,000 now is 662,000, right? And so, all right, so now let's, let's take a, a, a lesser aggressive percentage rate. So you take 6%, right? Even if you did 6%, which is which is reasonable, this is a very doable number every year, six to eight, right? That's $57,000 on a $10,000 investment, right? So if you look at that and to his example, you say, okay, hey, you, you, you come out, uh, you start working and you start adding up. You say, hey, I can't start adding $10,000 off the rip, but Say you start at, you know, $2,000 a year in your 401 and every year you get a, and this is what I tell people to do every year you get a raise, whatever your raise amount is up that by the percentage. So if you get a 10% raise, meaning a $200 raise on, on a, uh, I mean, uh, if you're making say $20,000, you get a 10% raise, then that means you, you just going to make an additional $2,000, right? If you added that up and increased your, percentage up 10% on that. So where you were putting in $2,000, now you put in $2,200. Um, then add the 22 there and start to grow that. And you can see in 30 years time that that money is going to grow. So if you just continue to add to it, this is the power of compound growth that Milton was talking about is that if you have a 30 year, a 40 year career, and you're making this percentage amount and you just add to it and you're earning a, a six to eight percent gain, that money is going to grow over time and it's going to be significant. You just got to continue to to uh, um, you just got to continue to invest in it and, and put your put your put your your funds into it. Right. So on that, I, I would say that um, definitely start early. Uh, stay in the market. And so if you go back to where we were talking about VOO, like I said, since 2011, this is up 458%, right? So that's four and a half times. If that was 10, you know, $10,000, you know, 458%, you know, that's 40,000 with $40,000 or, or more. It might be more with the compound on that. So, there's definitely a way to, to get to this, but you got to use time in your favor and use compound interest uh, in order to do so. All right. I see you back, Mill. You can, you can continue. Uh, sorry, everyone. It's called bad internet. <laughs> no worries. Hey, Mike, you still sharing this screen right here? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I did all of that. And yeah, nobody. I wasn't, even, I wasn't even on the right screen. Thanks, Barry. Why ain't nobody say something? I didn't know if you were sharing. I didn't yeah, know. I, I was sharing and talking through it. Hold on, let me let me share. Let me stop the share and I'm gonna reshare again. All right. Yeah, sorry about that. I went through that whole example, and y'all didn't see what I was looking at. All right, can y'all see my screen now? Yes. yes, I can see it. Okay. Yeah, I can see it, Mike. Yeah, you see the spreadsheet? Yeah. All right, cool. So what I was saying here, so this is a this is a a, a rule of 72 
is what it's called. So what rule of 72 just means that any interest rate that you earn, uh, you divide that by 72, it tells you how, how long it takes your money to double. So if, if I if I took a, a 10% interest rate, it would take seven, a little bit like 7.2 years for my money to double. So at year seven, that's what this first column represent is year. So a year between year seven and year eight, my money is going to double from that initial $2,000 uh, investment. So what I was saying earlier, say you take a, take a thousand dollar investment, right? Say, let's just, we'll, we'll just keep the number simple at 10%. And let's say you got a 30 year career, right? 30 year career. That's what that represents. That thousand dollars would turn into $17,000 because of compound interest with the annual return of 10% a year, right? Now you take that same thousand bucks and say, okay, now what if you were able to put in $10,000 in over 30 years earning 10% interest? That's $174,000, right? So the example that I was given earlier, so go back, let's go back to what Milt said. So you come out and you start your career and you start putting in a little bit of money every month and in your 401k or even saving on the side. And let's say, let's say we don't use a, let's say we use an 8%. 8% is a doable amount over a long period of time. So that same $10,000 would be $100,000. And that's just a one-time investment. Now, if you're adding to it monthly or, or yearly, then it would be much more than that, but it won't be a straight, you know, computation because you have to figure out what year it was added, blah, blah, blah. But the idea is just take a long term approach, use time and, and, and compound interest in your favor and your money will grow. It's just that simple. And, and the way that you can do that, what he suggested was VU. VU is a Vanguard S and P 500. Why we suggest VU is that Vanguard is a is a mutual fund ETF company, and they have low fees. They have some of the lowest fees in the industry. And what the S and P and what it's going to do is it's a passive index fund or passive ETF. So what it does, it's just going to follow the S and P. So when I was talking about the S and P earlier in our index, this is just the index here, right? And all it's going to do is just do what this thing does. So if I went back to, what was that? Sometime 11 on that chart. If I charted this up and say, not chart it, but if I measured it, so it's at 400, uh, it's a little bit different, but it's a, uh, this one says 316, but the other one was 440, 458. So over that same amount of time, it's just going to follow the performance of the S and P 500. And so if you look at that, what that is on a year to year basis, and I, I'll have to look it up to see what VU is on a, uh, what's the annual compound interest rate. I would say it's probably in the, it's probably the eight to nine. Let's just take a 9% rate there overall. And if you average that for 30 years, that initial $10,000 investment is $132,000, right? But and, and the other point I made earlier was that as you get a raise, every time you get a raise each year, bump up your 401k contributions, bump up your savings, bump up your, your, your Roth IRA contributions. Because if you have a budget that you've been living on, you, you know how to live on what's, what's already in your budget. So as opposed to now treat yourself, I'm not going to say that you don't, but pay yourself first before you treat yourself and pay yourself means that invest more, save more then buy, you know, whatever nice thing you want to buy, take a trip or whatever. Because again, this is a long-term game. And, and if you play the long-term game, use the, the power of time in conjunction with an annual interest rate that you get, that compound interest is going to work in your favor and you can reach your goals. Milt, you want to pick up on that? Unfortunately, I'm not sure where I dropped off at because if I dropped off at the wrong place, what I said may not have made any sense at all. Yeah, you, I think the last thing said, if, uh, shucks, I did remember it, but it's like if you have money or something and then it just kind of cut off. But I think what you were going through is just saying, uh, 
if you want to become a millionaire, you just need to be able to invest long term, use an instrument like VOO and dollar cost average into it. And, and, and you can reach that. But starting early and, and, and investing often in a good you know instrument like the uh, S&P 500 index and and you will get there. I think that was the essence of it. Yes, that's it. I think uh, one of the things people uh, forget about is, you know, things you learn in school, like delayed gratification. I mean, do you really need the best of everything when you're first starting out? Instead of that, just save a little bit more and take the pain of boo as it's going down right now because you are not looking at the price. You're looking at how many shares you have. If you have something that you know is going to be going up over time, it's going to gra- give you more gratification over time, then you just got to take that pain right now, buy it, buy it at a constant rate, like every month. You know, put 10, 50, it doesn't matter the amount at first. Because most people's salary is also going to be going up, even if your salary is stagnant. Just how much can you put in? <laughs> Go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't even mean to laugh. I'm thinking about what you just said, stagnate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, nah, I felt you on that. <laughs> Uh-oh, I hope you're not feeling that pain of, hey, no raise for you. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, oh, believe me, I feel that pain. <laughs> <laughs> but good. <laughs> so it, it's really... how. What level of savings do you want to be at? And like Mike said, don't hurt yourself because that's not going to last. You know, it's just like put your hand on the hot stove. You're going to move it sooner or later. So you got to have what is what can you save? And, you know, some people, that charts may not be that great. I, I know about that bill monster. Uh-huh. Every month, make that paycheck disappear. But you got to, no matter what, you got to be able to save some. Yep. Yeah, I would. I, I would say um, I tell the story. So, if anybody hasn't ever read the book "Rich Dad Poor Dad" by Robert Kiyosaki, uh, pick it up. You can get a used copy. I don't know for a few bucks or whatever. But read that book, and and I'll just give you the quick cliff notes on it. So basically, he he grew up. Uh, his mother and father didn't have any money management skills, but he had a good friend of his that he spent a lot of time with. And so this this friend's dad, um, he he managed money really well and he kind of showed him over the years. So he saw how his parents, you know, had a decent salary, but the choices that they made and what they did with their money was very different from what his uh his friend's dad did. And he saw that what his friend's dad was able to accomplish. So I didn't read that book until I was probably in my thirties or maybe in forties. And, uh, but I didn't realize after I read it, uh, I didn't realize that I actually had that experience in my own personal life. So my, my mother and my father, they were not very good with money management. Um, they made good money, but they just didn't choose to, to manage it in a, in a, in a savings investing way. Whereas my uncle and my aunt, they did. And I remember probably I was I was anywhere from say 12 to 14 I can remember you know different family members running to a tight spot and they would call my aunt and uncle and my aunt and uncle it it wasn't a matter if they would give it to them or not I mean it was I'm sorry it wasn't a matter if they had it it was a matter if they wanted to give it to them and I was like and so as a kid you're kind of watching this and overhearing these stories and it's like man how does auntie and pops always have the money? But then when you start to kind of get a little bit older and, and you know, get a job and you see how money and stuff works, then I started to, to see it was like, OK, they only had one car payment at a time. They live. They my aunt who's still living. She lives in the same house, you know, that I've ever since I've been born. They've been in the same house. You know, my uncle, when he was alive, he fixed his own cars. He uh, uh, put his, you know, changed his brakes, changed water heaters, painted his own house. They didn't do a lot of eating out and all of that. So I could see in the lifestyle choices that they made that they didn't live above their means, number one. And number two, 
my uncle this was back in the 80s and he would have these these uh t-bills and cds that he would buy all the time and and i can just remember my aunt getting mad because a cd would come due and cd is a certificate of deposit basically back in the 80s you could get you know seven eight nine percent on cds you lock them up for a year and once that year is over you've earned the interest during a year but then you get your principal back at the uh at the uh, uh expiration of of the uh um whatever the said time frame is so a cd would come up for for row you know for for expiration uh, and before she can get her hands on the money, he you know, went back to the bank and rolled it into a new one and locked it up for another year. But his he had a savings and an investing mentality. Now, he didn't do individual stocks uh, that much. He did a few, but but he just set a basis of knowing the difference between how you have that delayed gratification, what his mindset was, his long term perspective. And so he he retired in 90, either 93 or 94. Uh, and then he lived up until he was actually 94 years old. So he, his wife, five kids, uh, three grandkids, one great grandchild, they're still living off the same money that they've amassed in addition to their retirement earnings and, and pensions, you know, from all of that time ago. And it just really spoke to, I saw this 40 years ago and it still yielded dividends. And so this, this, this thing that Milton just explained in terms of delayed gratification mindset, long-term perspective, dollar cost averaging. And if you delay these things, and uh, I don't know if you all know this guy, you may have heard him on the radio. His name is, uh, man i just lost his name dave ramsey he says um uh save like others don't save and soon you'll be able to spend like others can't spend right or something to that effect and so as you delay and you you use this this perspective of dollar cost averaging in your favor over time if you delay that gratification you add to it and you start with a lump sum and you add to it over time and you get a decent interest rate over the years you're going to have well uh more than enough money but you got to make the sacrifices now and know that this is a long game because again like i say i saw their story 40 years ago and it's still yielding you know uh, uh benefits because my aunt you know my my cousin's uh, their their children and their great grandchildren are still reaping benefits of what my aunt and uncle put together, you know, fifty plus years ago. So that's an actual tangible example that I've seen work, and it can work for you. It, it can. Man, that's 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 beautiful. I guess I won't be able to get that new car now. <laughs> hey. No, <laughs> you, no, no, but, <laughs> but, but think about it. But Barry, I know you're joking because, well, no, no, but, no, no. So, no, so I, I wanted to piggyback on what y'all was saying is that the reason how I was able to get what I was able to get was because I never had a new car. I never had a car. I always bought a, a, a car that was like $3,000, $4,000 to ride it to the wheel. Well, and Barry, I'm still doing that to the day. Well, Barry, it's share a, if you don't mind, share a little bit of your your, your story. Oh uh, well, I, so you know, like you said, rich dad poor dad was a game changer for me, man. And when I read that book, understanding what's an asset and what's a liability, you know. So uh, I got on at the fire department. Okay, so I was working at the fire department, and during the fire department, we talk about living below your means. My pops always kind of taught me about live live below your means. You know, and so during the fire department, you know, as I was going through recruit training, I would save my money. And then that year, I told my pops, and my pops was a help to this, you know. Uh, I didn't pay no bills or anything, right? So that one year, I saved over 1000 I could have bought a nice car, but that really talk put that instill that like that is not an asset you know and i think as black folks or just people in general we want to show up that we got all this stuff 
and we need to be trying to save more and delay that that gratification. So uh yeah, so I'm I'm still delaying my uh, gratification, uh Mr. Milton. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, oh, wages are still and, and, wa- and wages are still stagnating. And another thing, that's another reason what got me into real estate because the fire department always has stagnation as far as wages for years, for years. So we all, I mean, you always had heard these firefighters have other side hustles, other side jobs. So that's another thing. Take that side money, your side hustle, and, and invest it. And create more and invest in assets. So, I always, anytime I look at a nice car, I always think like, "Dang, that's thirty thousand dollars down that I got. I could have used to, to buy a house or or uh, buy some real or stock, you know." So, I think that's the biggest thing, man, with black folks is that car. <laughs> we want to have a nice. We want we want, we want to have that nice car, man. <laughs> that's the yeah, first thing we get man, don't don't get me, it, it, don't get know, me started on these cars i mean it, i guess they gotta be producing some type of money some type of return so that's my thing you know not yeah, saying I, that a car can't yeah and I, I i'm i'm okay well not really i don't buy expensive cars either you know i i just it's just hard for me to have a crazy car payment right uh, yeah. I, I had to buy uh, my, my car got totaled out last year. So I had to buy a car this past year. And yeah. so, you know, I, 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 I can't stand car payments, but, but I, I still don't overpay for cars. For and, cars, exactly. Well, and, and, and so my thing on the whole car deal is, is that you have to consider the trade off that you're making. Right. So when you go back and you, again, you look at this chart. So let's just, let's just say, so you got a 300, Let's just say a four hundred dollar car payment, right? That's forty eight hundred dollars a year. So let's right. just put it. Let's put it in, in terms. Let's say you got a four point. Let's say you got a say four point five interest rate, right? right. Say that's seven. Right. Say that's seven years, right? So you you finance it. Say six years, right? So that's six thousand. Right. Well, and that's not every. That's that's per year. So it's forty eight. So it's it's even hard to do it this way. So eh, I can put that. And put that in. So it's just the interest that they're going to charge you. So you're going to pay two thousand dollars in interest on a on a seven year note, right? Uh, not two thousand, almost. So like, uh, what's that? Seventeen hundred dollars in interest. But say if you took that forty eight, let's just do five years. So it'd be twenty thousand. Just say make it easy. It'd be twenty five thousand dollars. All right. So in, in twenty five, you say twenty five thousand dollars that this car is going to cost you and you're going to pay, you know, this interest. So if it's $25,000 for the car, you're paying $6,000 in interest rate. Now, let's say you're a person that get a new car every five years, right? Right. So that's going to be $6,000 every five years over 30 year span, six times five, that's $30,000 in interest rate. I mean, just in interest rates that you pay, let alone the car. Right. right. Whereas, whereas if you took that same 48, just take a one time $4,800. Say you, you put that in a market, you gain 10% over 30 year period. That's $48,000. And that's just one year of car payments. Right. But if you know, versus if you took that same one car that you paid $25,000 for. Right, right, right. And you earn that same eight percent just in that in that one year. You you took you took five years where you drove your car five years longer than what you could. You took yeah. that twenty five thousand dollars. You invested it. Thirty years later, that twenty five thousand dollars is is two hundred fifty one thousand yeah. dollars. So think of it this yeah. way: you can delay getting one car in your lifetime. And it can be the difference between a half a million dollars if you can earn 8% on it. Yeah. And so, so is a car, uh, right. So is a car worth a quarter uh, quarter of a million dollars? I said, that's what I'm saying. A quarter of a million. So that's what I'm saying. It's literally a car is for 8.1 B. Now, when you get to the money, to the goals of your money, goals where you want to go, yeah, by all means, get you a nice car, you know? 
But until you get to where you want to get to, you know, I don't know. I want a new car. You know, I, ain't, I I'm not going to lie. I want a nice car. And I've been driving a 2005 Toyota Avalon. <laughs> but it's giving me the point A, point B, you know? I yeah. just, it's just hard for me to just be like, oh, I'm going to spend $30,000 for a car right now. Because I'm, it's, that it's, it's things that I feel like I could do with the thirty thousand dollars that I need to do. So yeah, and, that's and a, that, 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 go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. No, I just think that's a big thing with with us. And so the first thing I ask, people always ask me like, "Hey, how I get real estate? Get rid of your car. Get rid of your car." Because the first thing I see, I see six hundred dollars in notes, a six hundred dollar note, seven hundred dollar note. You know, so right. So, uh, Milt, you wanna wanna add to that? I know you got some wisdom on that. Actually, you guys hit it uh, right on the head. That's how you get wealthy, and that's how you do get to afford the great car. And, you know, it's sort of like when you're in your 20s and 30s, that's when you should be saving. That's when you have children. You should teach them this is where you need to put your money away. So by the time you get into your 40s and above, hey, you want that nice car? Get it. Because you're going to have the money saved up already for retirement and the money saved up for other things. But, you know, just you have to start. You have to start. I don't care how small it is. You have to start. You got to pay yourself. And, you know, everybody, your story, uh, uh, Barry's story, every one of them who have done this, you know, by the time they get my age, which is ancient, <laughs> they basically they have financial freedom. And, and that is the goal. That if that your boss is, you know, being a boss and you're tired of it, hey, good day to you, sir. But yeah. this is how you get there. Yeah, and and so I'll, I'll I'll finish with this piece in terms of the priorities. So I look at it, you know, and really let me let me add the the probably, the, and you know, I know this has worked for me. So this is just the the kind of the way that I look at how you need to prioritize you start with ties then you get you some emergency funds you know three to six months worth of funds that if you lost your job and you wasn't getting anything coming in you can still pay your bills uh your household can still run get some insurance either disability and disability and life insurance then from there you can start looking at savings then from there you look at retirements investing businesses whatever and then estate planning you know and so i I say build this as a pyramid from the bottom up, because if you do some of the things at the at the bottom of this, if you run into an issue where you need emergency funds, something break in the house, you got to put a you know new water heater in, the, the transmission went out in the car, blah, blah, blah. You will have to rob from this higher level investment stuff. So you wouldn't want to have to sell, you know, your Apple stock right now that you've been you know, holding for five years that you got a good gain in, but you don't have any emergency funds. And so you got to sell your Apple stock at the wrong time just to put a transmission in the car. So, you know, so you get your emergency funds squared away. You have some disability insurance because if you, you know, have to uh, uh, stay off work for a few months that you can still be getting uh, a paycheck coming in. You have life insurance such that in the event of an untimely death, that you don't leave your family in a financial burden, then, you know, you have savings, you know, and you have different buckets for savings, college, house, you know, cars, vacations, you know, whatever your other thing is. You start talking about your retirement, you know, 401k, Roth, uh, SEP programs, Kios, uh, and then investment, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, if you want to start your own business. And then don't forget about estate planning. What are you going to leave to your heirs, you know, uh, uh, in terms of what you've amassed and how you want your, your assets distributed. And, and Milton touched on it good at the end when he says that you have financial freedom. And, and so financial freedom can really be time. So, you know, I'm, I would like to be at a point where I can say, hey, if I don't want to work anymore, I can because I have enough money to pay my bills and do what I need to do. But I don't maybe I don't feel like doing this job that I have to do right now. 
But if I if I amass enough wealth in order to do that, then, you know, this time, you know, where I'm not punching this clock, you know, for 40 hours sitting at this desk, I could do something different. Right. So that's that's really the goal where for me, the time, it, the money, you know, can equal the time, you know, which can be really more of the freedom. So. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, and this is really where, where we're trying to get trying to get to. And and I'll, I'll say this last point, I'll finish. And that is, um, you know, one of the things that talking about with, with some people is just saying, hey, how can you get your family together to kind of get on this on this uh, uh, this path and then start pooling family resources? So there's this guy that was in Texas. He uh, as a young man. He went out to see the Kennedy's compound, uh, I think, up in uh, Massachusetts. And he said he was just so he just remember as a young guy, he said he was just so enamored with that. And he said that when he got older, if he became successful, he wanted his family to get together and build them a family compound. So him and his his sisters and stuff, they they all bought uh, some land and they built a, a, a pretty big estate house on and so it was a multifamily, uh, uh, a state house that everybody stayed in and they performed different functions. And what they did, they collaborated and they used the the power of, uh, of the funds that they had amassed together. And he said that he always wanted to do that. And so if you look him up, it's, uh, I think he's out of Dallas, Texas. And he built this, this house that he and his sisters that they own and they all manage and they pool their resources. And so there's a thing uh, called uh, a family office. So a bunch of these very rich families, they have enough wealth in their family where the wealth that they have, they use it to take care of their family, run the family businesses, invest and do all of these things. And they call them family offices. And uh, they, they basically manage their own money and, and, and certain people within that family, that's their job is to manage the family's wealth and to distribute it and different family members, you know, receive a portion of those earnings each year. So I, I would like to see us, you know, get to uh, uh, perspectives where we do that and, and, uh, and we'll be able to, we'll be able to uh, put some, some family offices stuff together as well. And, and so we can, we can uh, be able to achieve that where we can pass on some of this wealth to our children. So, you know, when they come out of school that they're not starting from, from ground zero, having to, to, you know, build the foundation over, but, you know, they had, they start with a, a bit of a leg up that, you know, we've, we've taken that long-term mindset and provided something for them so they can start off, you know, at, at a positive as opposed to as a negative Thank you all.